I'm here to introduce Mr. Chip Welch. Chip has over 12 years of experience working in information technology directly, ranging from hardware specialist work to project management. His project management experience includes running multi-million dollar application projects and serving as technical lead on an 18,000 server rollout. Currently, Chip is working as an instructor at the University of Northwestern Ohio, teaching marketing, management, information, business information management, and project management classes. He has a degree in business administration and management information systems from Indiana Tech. His MBA is from Indiana U University and he is currently working toward his PhD in global leadership at Indiana Tech. So uh, please welcome the future Dr. Chip Welch. <laughs> I'm about a year and a half away. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, let's do that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. <clears throat> As I said, my name's Chip Welch. Uh, you heard a little bit about my background. Uh, I have a tendency to be a little on the funny side at times. I tell people I grew up just outside of normal, which is true, normal Illinois. If you find a little town called Carlock on the map and start to scroll out, you'll find Normal is about 11 miles south east of where I lived at, grew up. People tell me they want to get back to Normal, I'm going, no you don't, it's really kind of a boring place. <laughs> um, it's about the most exciting thing you see in the papers, public urination stories from Illinois State University. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk today about building effective teams and improving uh, results. It's the discussion about creating value within IT. There's a problem, business executives. They believe that IT is detached from real world business problems. They believe that IT uh, adds features that are not really needed. They have difficulty explaining the need for expensive equipment, software. We have a difficulty explaining cost justification. <clears throat> Why do I need that central switch? What good does it do me? I'm going to spend all this money on a central switch. What, what value does it bring to me? Business executives don't understand that. They don't speak geek, right? Yes. <clears throat> and so you have a challenge of trying to help them understand that. There's a difficulty in defining ROI, which is not necessarily an IT problem. It's a business problem. Technical executives believe business leaders lack vision. There's a lack of understanding on how technology can be applied, and there's a reluctance to change and adapt to the environment, both internal and external. So my question to you, who's right? Are the business executives right or are the technical executives right? Technical. Both are right. Yeah, both are right. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I had a business manager uh, once. Uh, our CEO had come to me and said, I see that you guys are working on this a training application, training website. Uh, the CEO says, I think this is a great opportunity for us. I want you to go talk to our communications manager about seeing if we can use this to roll out to our member stores. Okay. So we did, and we set up a meeting, did our presentation. Presentation went on for about a half hour. It was a nice website. It had forums and wikis and uh, the way to do uh, computer-based training options. We had videos, all sorts of really cool stuff to do training. And it was a pull type of a situation where you, it was on demand. You could access it at any time. You didn't have to spend a whole lot of time storing videos and DVDs and just taking up a bunch of space. It was a great tool. We got through the presentation. The communication manager says to us, I don't know how we use this. Our IT trainer, I had to practically hold her down because she was about ready to strangle the communications manager. I had a, an IT manager once tell me, I don't know how we are going to, uh, I don't know why we need to uh, update inventory in real time. We only ship orders once a day. Okay, well, if we update orders in real time, you know, inventory in real time, we might be losing sales if we don't. 
because we get the orders processed, we have to cancel them. They're going to go to someplace else. There's opportunity there that gets lost. So we as IT executives need to try to understand the business side of things, and the business side needs to try to understand the IT side of things. <coughs> In 2003, Nicholas Carr published uh, an article called IT <coughs> Doesn't Matter in the Harvard Business Review. The major points of business has made it a strategy expecting IT to be a panacea for all business problems. IBM ran a commercial sort of alluding to this whole thing. They had this contraption in the middle of a table and a bunch of executives sitting around going, what does it do? It beeped and whirred and did all sorts of things. In the end, one guy says, I don't know, but it's supposed to solve all of our problems. Billions of dollars have been spent on IT with little or no assessment of return. So we put IT in place, but we don't go back and follow up and say, did we get value out of it that we said we were going to get? Uh, there were limitations to the car article. It assumed that IT had reached its zenith. Since then, we've had a bunch of new inventions like the iPhone, the <laughs> iPad. There's an app for that kind of a thing. <coughs> Competitive advantage is short-lived. So we put a lot of money into IT, but expecting IT to fix things. But that competitive advantage we get from IT really isn't there. People are what drive competitive advantage. Right? The difference between me and Albert Pujols, I can use the same bat he does, but he gets much different results. <laughs> IT is a tool. A bat's a tool. All right? He's just much better at baseball than I am. Uh, <clears throat> he uses a limited definition of infrastructure technology. He kind of flip-flops between infrastructure being just hardware and infrastructure being software and hardware and then the processes around it. He flip-flops between the two of them. But for the most part, it seems like he talks about it just being a hardware thing. So teams are the foundation for execution of directives in business. For many companies, the execution of those directives takes place in committees and project teams. Project failure or ineffective teams have high costs associated with them, leading to increased scrutiny of all IT dollars spent. So if we fail, management's going to start paying more attention to us. So we don't want to fail. So today we're going to discuss the factors affecting project failure. We're going to talk about the components of an effective team. And we're going to take the steps to help in delivering effective results. That's what we want to do. So project failure equals project team failure. For project team, success is generally measured on being on time, on budget, and delivering a high quality project. We want to deliver a high quality product. Now, management's usually okay if we're off on time and we're off on budget by a little bit if we deliver that high quality product. Right? But what determines quality? Quality, I define quality as adherence to a standard. I talk about McDonald's in some of my management classes when we talk about quality. Uh, I always ask the question, does McDonald's produce quality food? And I always get the answer, no, because if people think it's nasty. McDonald's doesn't really taste good, but that's because it doesn't adhere to your standard of quality. It adheres to McDonald's standard of quality. That's why when we go to uh, the McDonald's over there on a the lighter road, and we order a Big Mac, and we go out to San Diego, and we order a Big Mac out in San Diego, we expect the same sandwich, delivered the same way, prepared the same way, it's consistent, it's quality. It may not taste appealing to you, but that's your standard. <clears throat> For uh, usually a failure in one of these areas will lead to a failure in other areas. So if we really extend time on a project, we're going to extend cost, uh, hopefully to deliver a better quality product. If we shrink either one of those, we're going to expect the others to be affected as well. In project management, we call that the iron triangle, the relationship between cost, time, and quality. Uh, from my experience, in 2009, Do It Best Corp initiated an employee website pro project. We were replacing uh, the current foundation with SharePoint. Issues abounded with the project. There's poor communication with the primary stakeholder. There's a poor understanding of the stakeholder needs and poor understanding of the goals and requirements of the project. Part of that was because 
IT management had one philosophy on how the project needed to be done, and the business side had a different philosophy on how the project needed to be done. The business side wanted this whole brand new website with a brand new look and feel, and options for trying to develop a community, like an internet community within the company. IT management just wanted to move the content over and leave it put. There was a miscommunication there. And no matter how much the project manager at the time tried to convey to IT management that this isn't going to fly, the business isn't going to like this, IT management said, nope, that's what we're directed to do, that's all we're going to do. Uh, <clears throat> long story short, the project was supposed to take two months, it took six months, and a lot of it had to do with rework because requirements, even if they were identified, they were shot down by management. In March of 2013, McKinsey and Company were contracted to do an assessment of the healthcare.gov project for the United States government. If you want to look up colossal failure, this is colossal <laughs> failure. <laughs> October 1st rolls around, and I'm being told by my coworkers, this website's not working. This website's not working. It's a colossal failure. It's all the Obama administration's fault. Not really. It's not completely the Obama administration's fault. It has to do. The McKinsey and Company uh, presentation delivered, they delivered, noted the issues with evolving our requirements, that under ideal circumstances, the project would have had a clear articulation of requirements and success metrics. Make note of that, because we're going to talk about that later. Without even reading any news articles that morning, the morning of October 1st, 2013, I told my wife and several people that I worked with. Poor requirement definition. <laughs> Had nothing to do with anything that President Obama himself had done. It's probably a lot lower than what he is. But he being the leader has to own it. <clears throat> so organization goals should be reflected in project goals. <coughs> meaning that we have to tie what the organization's needs are to the project needs. In business, we call this management by objective. All right. And the nice thing about management by objective is we, it gets us to all start marching in the same direction. Uh, if we don't do this, we are all start marching different ways. Uh, the Ohio State Marching Band, always known for their field configurations, yeah, they have good directions, they have understanding of what they're supposed to be doing. Value can be both tangible and intangible. When I talk about tangible value, this is where we look at the direct costs. I pay money, I expect to get a return on my investment. All right, cost versus benefit analysis. That's tangible. Intangible results are things that may not necessarily have true value to the company in terms of monetary dollars, but they might have value to the company. Uh, if you put a new cafeteria in into your workplace, is that going to give you a return on investment in terms of dollar amount? Probably not. But what it might do is actually increase employee morale. And that's hard to define and hard to quantify what the value of that kind of project is. Success criteria needs to be defined up front, meaning that we need to have clearly defined goals. We need to know when we've gotten there. Success criteria should be defined in a binary manner. Speaking to an IT crowd, you guys know what binary means, right? It's either on or off. Either I did it or I didn't. Uh, example I use, I'm a Cub fan. I'm cursed to be a Cub fan. Growing up, rooting for the Cubs, the one thing we always want them to do is win the World Series. It never happens. I have a friend who works up the street. He's a Cubs fan and a Browns fan. The guy's just hurting. <laughs> He, has, he leads a life of disappointment. Uh, I use this with my students. I talk to them about defining a SMART goal. So the Cubs' goal every year is to win the World Series. It's specific. We have a specific goal. Is it measurable? Yes. yes. It's binary. Either they win it or they don't. Is it attainable? No. <laughs> well, I disagree with you for, I, I disagree with you for one, one main reason. 
If it were the Chicago Bears, I would say winning the World Series is unattainable. The, or the Fort Wayne Tin Caps, or the Dayton Dragons, or the Toledo Mud Hens, it's impossible for them to win the World Series. It's not an attainable goal. But for the Cubs, because they play Major League Baseball, and the big championship prize at the end of the year is winning the World Series, it's attainable. Is it realistic? <laughs> no. <laughs> At least not with the current team. First time since 1988, a team didn't score a run in the doubleheader. Oh. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> the last aspect of this is time work. If you're going to set a goal, you need to set a deadline with it. If you don't set a deadline, you're never going to try to accomplish it. And that's just reason. But if you keep in mind that you want to make the goals binary, you want to have them so you can measure them, then you should be pretty good at least at getting those things done up front. This is the first step in really building team effectiveness. Having that mission, having that vision, having a goal in front of them so they know what they're working toward. And it has to be clearly defined. If it is not, there are countless websites that will tell you. They have lists like four or five options, sometimes three, on why projects fail. Usually the reason listed, number one or number two, is poorly defined requirements and poorly set goals. Desenza and Foreman wrote a, uh, did a research article for the Project Management Institute in that they had four, four bullet points of their seven reasons that project failed, projects failed that all tied back to goal setting. And a lot of it has to do with this disconnect between business and IT. That we don't do a good job of trying to hold the business accountable for the information that they're given. And then business doesn't do a good job of holding IT accountable to deliver on those results. And a lot of it's because we don't understand each other. And sometimes the business doesn't understand itself. Working for Do It Best Corp, they're a hardware store co-op. Uh, if you want to tour a store not too far from here, Cross Lumber is about two blocks that way. Cross Lumber uh, and Do It Center, they're a, a nice small little store, typical of the stores that Do It Best has. Do It Best being a hardware wholesale company, they have this thing called a SKU, stock keeping unit. You would think that working for a hardware company, that everybody in the merchandising area that's in charge of buying product, and everybody that's in IT who's in charge of tr keeping track of this product through IT processes, would understand what a SKU is and what a SKU means to the company. You can sit and get 20 people in the room together that are all supposed to be experts in how the warehouse management system works and how our business processes work. And they would all be talking back and forth, nodding in agreement that they're talking about SKU being defined as such and such, and they're all talking to each other, but they're not saying the same thing. Some of them believe that SKU is unique. Unfortunately, for Do It Best, SKU is not unique. And there was ways around it to make it unique. Uh, it was an interesting situation. I kind of had a follow-on from uh, previous uh, an old mainframe issue, and I mean an old mainframe issue. <coughs> so what we did was SKU uh, at the warehouse level. So between, if we did SKU and warehouse together, we could make it find a unique product. We just had to concatenate the file, so concatenate the field. So. <coughs> make use of metrics, so for success criteria. I want to make use of metrics. Uh, specifically for each project, we would like to set up key performance indicators, KPIs. You guys know where indicators are made? <coughs> Hell. <laughs> no. They're made indicator. Uh, yeah, bad joke. Uh, I know. It helps uh, laugh. <coughs> All right. Uh, it allows for understanding of and normalization of products acro projects across departments. Uh, how do we compare the value of a project that affects our purchasing department? with the value of a project that affects our warehouse department. How do you do that? Any ideas? 
uh, prior companies I've worked for, they get the executive management in a room and let them duke it out. They basically had to convince the top two people, the CEO and the COO, that their project was the most important because of such and such a reason. You want to try to get some way of normalizing that. So from top to bottom. And really, in all honesty, IT has to own this part of it because it's your budget. You're the one that's going to be performing the work. So all you need to do is just get management to agree to what projects are most important. It's difficult. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Mennonite Church. Getting 10 people together to agree on anything is next to impossible, and I found that that's not just a Mennonite thing. Getting 10 people to agree on anything is next to impossible. Uh, the value of IT upgrades, regardless of whether it is a software project or hardware project or whatever, needs to be expressed in terms of cost benefit. IT needs to learn to speak the language of the people they're talking to. When I, uh, I wrote a, I talked about that 18,000 server project in my introduction. Uh, the 18,000 server project was for State Farm Insurance. It was 18,000 servers in 18,000 different locations. That's project complexity. One of the things that we had to do, uh, we were doing a purchase recommendation. And we wrote this purchase recommendation, we wrote our executive summary, and I guarantee you management did not read past that the first page of the executive summary. Did not. We had a 20 page document, they only read page one. The reason for that was because we expressed things on page one in terms that they understood. We talked about some of the features, we just mentioned the feature name, but we talked about what the return would be for the company. So IBM, uh, this IBM server that we were getting had light path diagnostics in it. For some of you that are the old school IT guys who worked on the e-servers, you know what light path diagnostics are. There are little LED lights that pop up next to failed components on a server. Management doesn't care about that. They don't. What management cares about was this could reduce our diagnostic time by about 30 minutes. That management cares about. Because downtime costs money. Uh, agent offices. Downtime in an agent office, that costs money. <clears throat> Those things are important to management. Money. <clears throat> Accounting can also help. Defining payback period. You guys are familiar with payback period, right? Uh, some companies have a defined payback period. When I was at State Farm, whenever we were doing a project assessment and pitching a project assessment, we had to have our return on investment filled within three years. So every project we did we had to determine whether the cost benefit was going to be realized within three years. That was important for them. At Do It Best, we didn't have any of that. In fact, um, my manager went to the accounting department and asked, do you have uh, any idea on what our standard payback period is? No. So we had to do cost benefit. And there's, <coughs> it's not really a bad thing not to have a standard payback period. You can survive without that, but you do need to talk about how long it's going to be before you return, realize your return on investment. Internal rate of return, that's usually a percentage. What kind of percentage return do you want to get? It's a way of choosing an internal method of weighing projects, trying to weigh that value against one another. And when we get later on, if I've got time, I will pop up a spreadsheet of project uh, it's a project selection matrix where you can actually choose criteria based on the goals of the company, weight those criteria, give them a number, a rating number, and it will help, this, help you decide, have a number of value associated with those projects. So now you're leaving the decision making out of uh, this emotional aspect of it, leaving the management to duke it out between each other, and now you're having something that says these projects fit within our value system. Projects need to be prioritized based on organization goals and values. Things that are important to the organization. Why is that important? 
it's important to the organization, it's important to management. Management controls the budget. Management's gonna give you money if they think it's important. And they're the ones that are determining that. They oftentimes ask you, you know, what value do you guys bring to the company? Well, they're determining what value you bring to the company. That's not the question I have to answer. If we work right, we get them to answer the question for themselves. Projects should be broken down into small, more manageable pieces. Value can be returned more consistently and more constantly. There's a guy named John Cotter. He uh, wrote a book in 1996 called Lead and Change. A lot of people, if you take, would ever take a change management class, John Cotter's book is usually one of those that people cite. A couple different principles he had. The first one, projects need to be prioritized based on organization goals and values. That's the getting management behind it. He wants you to get a guiding coalition. The other part of that, breaking the project down smaller. If you break the projects down smaller, you can get the projects accomplished quicker. You can start delivering value quicker. And the company starts seeing tangible results quicker. There's a project methodology philosophy called Agile. You guys familiar with Agile at all? Uh, Agile, that's a whole purpose behind Agile. You take this whole big project and you break it down into two to three week, maybe four week sprints. Mm -hmm. So you take the work that you're gonna do, you break it down into a month to month basis, and you say, I'm only gonna focus on this work. And at the end of the month, you have something that is production ready, that can be implemented right away. So management starts seeing these results. I've got something tangible I can see it can hold. It creates value for them. And so just part of the management, so we're starting to break these things down. And if you notice, I haven't really ever talked about team yet, the actual team, because all of this, all of this part of all this breaking down of these things is the first step in building team effectiveness. If I know where I'm going, I can get that project accomplished. The team can get that project accomplished. <clears throat> uh, other aspects of this, we need to develop a common language. So executive managers, the VPs of the different areas of the business. They need to be IT aware. <coughs> Doesn't necessarily mean they need to know the nuts and bolts of IT. That's not what that means. But they need to be IT aware. So you need to have a basic understanding of how the systems work, what the functions are, and how those functions can be leveraged. They need to have that kind of an understanding. IT leaders need to be teachers. We need to explain things in terms that are easy to understand. I like to use analogies. Uh, Greg Davis, he worked, I don't know if he's still at IBM or not, he worked at IBM, he was their performance guru. Uh, worked out at the Research Triangle out in uh, North Carolina. He used this analogy to describe the difference between a server and a PC, and I thought it was a brilliant analogy, and I like use, reusing it. Which is faster, PC or a server? Server. Standard IT answer. Mm -hmm. No, 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 the standard IT answer. Do you know what the standard IT answer is? It depends. Uh, yes. <laughs> Anybody in business asks you a question, you want to give them an answer? It depends. Standard IT answer. All right. Uh, PCs generally can have faster processors. They can do better from graphics. But they're not usually good at per, per, uh, <coughs> servicing large amounts of data, processing large amounts of data. Uh, the analogy this guy used is he says uh, the difference between a server and a PC is kind of like the difference between a school bus and a sports car. I can have a Corvette and a Corvette and a school bus. A Corvette is going to blow the doors off of the school bus any day of the week unless I'm wanting to haul a lot of people. Then the Corvette is not as much of use. If I want to move 300 people in a Corvette, I have to make 300 trips because I'm the driver and i got to be in there but then I'm hauling one person at a time. But if I got a 70 passenger school <coughs> bus, I don't have to make near as many trips. That's the difference between a server and a PC. That's an analogy you can use to executives that are outside of IT that they understand. Those are the kinds of things that you want to make sure that you're doing. Explain things that they, in terms that they understand. Uh, 
You need to understand how IT can create value for stakeholders. We know how IT can create value. We know that. We know that IT can help us become, become more efficient in processing. We know that IT can help us uh, regulate internal business processes, help us answer questions, make decisions, provide us with information to make those decisions. We understand that. We need to be able to try to communicate that to our business partners so that they understand. Business needs need to be met. Without the business needs being met, we're out of a job. They're going to bring in somebody that they think can do it better. The prioritization should focus the needs of the customers and the company goals. Customers, in this case, aren't necessarily the end consumer. Customers can be internal or internal stakeholders, the other business people they work with. They can be the end consumer. And if we're in a publicly traded company or a stock held company, those customers are the ones who are affected as well. Uh, State Farm's a stock held company. If you are a policyholder with State Farm Insurance, you are part owner of the company. Some of you know that? Did you guys know that? Yeah. Do it best, the member owners, the member store, the store owners, they're owners of the company. So when we were making decisions, all of our decisions had to go back to how did it affect the policyholder, how is it going to affect the member? Those were our true customers. Term definitions is important. I can't stress this enough. You have a database dictionary. You have to have a database dictionary. The database dictionary is going to basically take, and it's exhaustive to create. It really is. But the database dictionary is going to list out all of the data fields that you have in your database, and it's going to define the, those fields on what they are. And if you can do it right, you're going to have it set up as an entity relationship diagram. So you're not only seeing the, what the fields mean themselves, but how they relate to other fields. And that's important because everybody needs to speak the same language. If I say skew, everybody I'm speaking with needs to know what that means. Common words have more than one meaning. Sun. If I say sun, what do you guys think of? The sky and my child. Pronounced the same, have more than one meaning. And then there are other words that are spelled the same, but they have more than one meaning. Homophones, right? We run into that all the time in business. When I was uh, first started working in business, uh, State Farm had this process they called SMP, System Management Process. But when I went to an IBM conference, uh, all the people at IBM kept talking about SMP, and they were talking about symmetric multiprocessing. Right? It can get confusing. So you need to make sure you understand that. Terms can be vague. Now we're going to talk about actually building effective teams. I talked about the, all this other stuff first, because this part here is affected by all of that, especially the goal setting part. <coughs> Steve Yex and Thomas Britt noted six components of building team effectiveness. These are six components of effective teams. They published these in their book, Organizational Psychology. <clears throat> Each is limited on the basis of resources. So team composition. Right? You can't field a baseball team without a shortstop. Uh, although you might be able to get away with it, uh, you really can't field a baseball team without a pitcher or a catcher. If you don't have a catcher, the umpire is going to get real mad real fast. <laughs> You can't do that. So you need to make sure you have the right components. Uh, management needs to understand that you might have somebody who's learning how to do certain aspects of a job, and they need to give you some consideration and leeway. Uh, if you're a project manager, you need to make sure you identify that as a risk up front. Organizational resources. Rewards within team process, tasks to die, and goals. We're going to talk about each one of those. Uh, roles under team clear composition, you need to make sure that they're clearly defined. Make sure that people understand what they're doing. I used to coach second and third graders in softball, and any ball hit to the outfield, I gave my outfielders one instruction, throw the ball to second base. That was it. Get, the, get to the ball, I couldn't expect them to catch it because they were lousy at that. 
but I expected him to get to the ball and throw it into second base. That's all he needed to do. And it worked remarkably well. You would not believe how many runs you can save in a little league game just by following that philosophy. It's amazing. Expectations need to be understood. So I need to have a clearly defined understanding of what I'm expected to do. And there needs to be agreement with that, both from a management perspective and from the employee perspective. So I'm a, as a project manager, I would talk to each one of my team members and I need to make sure that they understand what I need them to do. And they need to repeat back to me so that we understand each other. Team members should be expected to contribute. If you don't have anybody, if you have somebody on the team that's not contributing, they're dead weight. Get rid of them. You don't necessarily need to fire them, but you need to get them off your project because they're not contributing. They're not helping. You want to have people that are going to your project team meetings. You want to have people that are interested in what you're doing. If they're not interested in what you're doing, they're not helping. Not helping at all. Organizational resources. Teams need to have access to the appropriate capital and equipment. That's a hard thing to do. Resources in any corporation are finite. They're finite, there's a limit to them. But this is where the prioritization comes back into play. Where am I gonna send my resources? When am I gonna spend my resources? Challenges discerning what is appropriate. Yeah. What is appropriate? What's the appropriate level of funding? I had a project once, uh, it was related to that uh, employee website project. We were redoing our member portal. The initial budget for it was $500,000. I got the budget down to $68,000. 68. Hardware, software, the whole shoot matching group. And I was told it wasn't cut enough. That's frustrating. It, it really is. <coughs> uh, but eventually, you know, came this management that this is the appropriate level. Appropriate level. Teams are expected to do more or less. This is just reality. I know uh, many IT departments, we are short-staffed. We are short-staffed. That's just reality. <coughs> uh, expectations need to be set based on the investment level. So if they're going to give us a project and it's not going to be quite what we initially asked for, we need to go back through and set expectations on what we are going to be able to deliver based on that financial information. It's going to be painful, and most conversations that need to be had are painful, but those are the kinds of things that we need to do. Explain to them, give them, set reasonable expectations on what to expect. Rewards. Most companies operate on an individual reward basis. I'm judged on my work and I am given merit increases and bonuses based on my work. But as an instructor, I'm pretty much an individual. So I don't really have to function much within a team environment. But project teams could actually benefit from having team rewards. There are a lot of studies out there that suggest that uh, self-managed teams actually can be quite effective in terms of delivering on company goals in delivering on projects. So teams should be rewarded based on performance. What does a team do? Uh, and rewards, rewards should be focused on the project goals. And since the project goals tie back to the organization goals, we see where that value is coming into play. Within team processes, uh, those are focused on methodology. If you're running projects, are you going to use Waterfall or are you going to use Agile? Or are you going to use some combination of both? Uh, are you going to use Six Sigma? It's another project management philosophy. It's process-based, but it's a project management philosophy. Everything's broken down into projects. What kind of methodology are you using? Methodology needs to be clear, it needs to be enforced. It needs to be followed and adhered to. Some methodologies you can use some flexibility because not everything's going to apply in every situation. We need to have a clear cut idea on how you're going to manage projects. Those within team processes. Lack of a well developed plan as cited as region projects have uh, significant failure. Significant rates of failure. Lack of a well defined plan. 
when you're developing your project plan, it's not a step-by-step -step process on everything you're going to do. It's a plan on what we're going to do in certain situations. You might have your project scheduled, but you're also going to be doing your risk management, change management, communications, those sorts of things. That's all about your planning piece. <clears throat> a well-developed plan allows for opportunities to correct mistakes. Um, one of the management books I use uh, has a line in there, managers need to make good decisions. No, they don't. Managers need to understand when they screw up and be able to adapt and fix those problems. It's unreasonable to expect managers to make good decisions all the time. It's unreasonable. Everybody makes mistakes. So as you fix, identify the problem early on, fix the problem early on. And task design. Within projects, teams and committees are tasks. Task designs need to be clearly defined. Business requirements, functional requirements, and technical requirements. Technical requirements aren't necessarily computer based. Not necessarily computer based. But business requirements and functional requirements. If you don't have the business requirements clearly defined, why are you doing the project in the first place? Functional requirements, those are the how to things we have to define. It's going to work this way. We want it to deliver this result in X number of time, kind of a thing. The <coughs> technical requirements uh, we're going to use this kind of a system or uh, follow this kind of a process. Process, I think, is kind of a technical thing. Then uh, the team goals. Uh, Kelly Project Solutions noted often the reason for projects not being uh, pre initiated is not always well defined. Um, Kelly Project Solutions are a consulting company. <coughs> one of the things they noted is uh, they put the blame, their number one reason for project failure was project manager incompetence. But <coughs> in their second reasoning, they said that oftentimes the project's not well defined and the project manager is not involved in that process. So I'm going, how can the number one reason be true, but the second reason clearly contradicts that reason? That's what happens when you do qualitative studies. Uh, ROI is not often tracked and goals uh, are not tracked to see if the project really did accomplish what they do. Uh, some CFOs will ask you, they'll set up time so that when a project ends, you have that date that you said you're gonna realize your return on investment, go back and actually see if you were accomplished what you did. And that's important because it helps to see if the planning processes, and the planning processes are a business just as much as IT, to see if the planning processes were accurate in the first place, your projections were accurate. And you do that because you learn from it. Uh, organizational goals or requirements definition. <coughs> Project and committee goals tied to organizational goals. I think I, I don't know. Uh, John Cotter states change vision needs to be present in order for change to be effective. You have to have an idea what your end result is. How do you know you, if you're going to plan a trip to Disney World, how do you know you got to Disney World? Pictures. Yeah. See the big castle or the Epcot ball. But you have this vision of what Disney World looks like, so you know you've gotten there. All right. Questions? I know a lot of information to process. Are these slides available? I can make them available. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll get them over to uh, Jeff LeBlanc. That's not a problem. I can do that. Um, they try to post them on the Alvea website, yeah. which is the hope. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure he's got those to get them posted out there. Uh, I did talk about the project matrix, project selection matrix. Um, this is loosely based on the matrix that we use at Do It Best. We have, up on the top, we have our solution criteria, and right down below that, we have the different weights. So impact on members, that was what we rated the highest. That was most important to us. Impact on customers had a little, little bit of a lower rating. Uh, effect on company goals, also important kind of a thing. And then we basically took all of those and we would rate them one to five. So if it had a high impact, we would rate it five. If we had a low impact, we would rate it one. And then we rate each one of 
these uh, different areas. And then I sorted this list. Uh, these numbers are completely randomly generated. But I sorted the list with the high number uh, being project number 14. That would be a project that we'd likely want to undertake because it's going to have the most impact on the company. It's just a way of trying to organize yourselves. And to be honest, th we didn't start doing this at Dua Best until about 2009. It's, it's, it's just a way of getting organized. Right. Yes, sir? Have you ever tried to put an hourly cost up against that out to the departments? Purchasing comes in, says, okay, we want this, but I, you have a team of 10, you have 10-year employees, 30-year employees. Put in a cost back. Okay, IT's hourly rate back to your department really right. is, and do you have that in your budget? Uh, when we were doing our project assessments, and we would include that under cost, we actually we actually had a standard rate for IT people, and we had a standard rate for hourly people. We had a different rate for management people, and so when based on the number of hours that we expected them to be involved with the project, we would do that labor assessment that way. Then we'd include that as a line item when we were developing. Did you put our something in for the tangible and intangible costs? The fact that this person's been here 20 years is different. Mm -hmm. Do you have a worksheet on that? What they did, what uh, Do It Best would do is they averaged it out. So, uh, like, uh, we might have an employee who we uh, be, would be on the project that might be a one to two year employee. And if we really did an assessment on the dollar amount that they earned, uh, including benefits and everything else, it might only be like $40 an hour. Uh, and we would uh, do an average rate of, say, like $60 an hour. And then uh, we might have somebody else on a project later on who'd been there for like 30 years. Uh, top pay scale and, and that sort of a thing and his going rate might actually be $80 but they would calculate that out they'd use that $60 to kind of kind of as a catch-all in a way and did you cross the line where you outsourced it and did not put that person on the project yeah we did we did have separate line items for outsourcing too and those are uh, certainly important things to consider from from cost standpoint any other questions if you would like to get a hold of me, I did give my contact information up there. I also have my business card that is available for you guys as well. So uh, feel free to call me. I am more than happy to come in and talk. And I do that through the university, so usually it's not any sort of a charge. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you.